All right, welcome everyone to another episode of the Indie Investor Pod. This is Indie Investors talking indie investing, and today we're going to get into uh, some private lending and some other uh, great investing topics here in Indianapolis. So get ready, take some notes, and with that, let's get on with today's episode. All right, guys, what's up? This is the Indie Investor Pod. I'm Randy, this is me, Randy, with uh, as the host today. I've got uh, my good friend, good buddy, uh, Jesper Bavasia. How you doing, man? Doing well, sir. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Pleasure. Absolutely. So, uh, just Bree, we've got, uh, I, I'm excited to have you on today because previously I did a, a podcast with a friend of mine out in Sacramento who kind of focuses on raising private money. And mm -hmm. you're the guy that lends the private money. Yep. So we're going to get, we're going to get your, uh, your side of things here and, um, kind of what your, uh, background is and, um, how you're using your private money to kind of leverage yourself and then also uh, get into some some other projects you have going on. So um, just real quick, um, starting off, why don't you just give us a little background of yourself um, and then we'll kind of get into into the nitty gritty here. Yeah, so I quit my uh, nine to five last year at a healthcare company doing compliance, regulatory compliance work. And I've just been full-time real estate since then. I've been doing a lot of private lending over the last two years. And when I say a lot, I mean definitely 100 plus transactions so far in India alone. And I have been involved with buy and hold, flix, uh, fix and flip, and uh, syndications. I've, I've, I'm a passive investor in probably six syndications right now. So yeah, I'm trying to cover as many bases as possible. Okay. And do you do this as like, is real estate your full-time gig? Do you have a, do you have a nine yeah. to five is, is what was that? Yeah, yeah, like? no. So once I, since I left my last year of my job last year, this is it full-time real okay. estate, full-time private lending. And definitely like it's, it's all thrown into the same, you know, fix and flip and buy and hold. And cause I'm analyzing deals all the time, yeah. literally all the time, whether yeah. it's, you know, a wholesaling deal, if it's a fix and flip, if it's a buy and hold, if it's a deal that's come to me from a borrower, it's just Dina analysis all the time. And that's, that's you're, basically my nine to five. <laughs> you're, pr you're probably on so many buyers lists, aren't you? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Always scouring through those emails and uh, Facebook posts, I bet. Um, yeah, yeah, all the time. So uh, how, how did you get into because I, I, did you start out just private lending or did you do some projects yourself or how did, how did, how did you start um, in yeah, the so real estate investing world? I started off with a buy and hold strategy I got from zero to four duplexes in six months in Indianapolis, all out of state. I'm here in California. And once I got that started, I went through a couple of property managers and the bids for rehab and bids for you know, tenant turns and then evictions. And I just wasn't liking it. And I said, okay. you know what, this is not the game for me. So slowly but surely it took me a little bit of time, but right around the two year mark from when I originally started back in uh, late 17, I went ahead and sold everything off. And I was down to no physical assets of my own. I sold the primary home I was living in. I sold the investments that I had. So I had no debt and no assets except for the liquid cash in my bank account and any retirement savings and stuff like that. So from that point on, I just said, all right, well, what can I do with this cash besides buy and hold? So I got into private lending and the first loan I did was out in Indy. It was a pretty substantial dollar amount, a quarter million, and it just went well and snowballed into one to six and probably six months and then just took off the year after that. So. It's It's been a crazy ride, but fun. I love it. I love the passiveness of it because, yeah, even though I'm analyzing the deals it, after that point, it's I don't have to deal with contractors or vendors yeah. or evictions or any of that stuff. It's just the money comes in at the end and every month and whatever the terms are. And I love that process. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. Um, so how much would you say uh, private lending versus actually uh, buying projects for yourself is if, it, if it's either a rental or a flip? Um, like, is there, are you doing more of the lending or are you kind of doing more of the deals uh, for yourself now? Or what's that look like? Yeah, I would say it's, it was definitely more lending up until May. And starting in May, it's been more focusing on my stuff and less lending. 
but I think I'm ready to go back to more lending and less of my own stuff just because of the amount of time that I have to spend in managing the GC and talking to broker and getting the, everything fixed line item by line item and yeah. go back and punch lists. And yeah. You're like, you're like, it's much easier just to say, Hey, here's my money. Bring me back Get some more done. money in return. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. Exactly. It's yeah. way easier and sometimes faster. I don't know. It's yeah, fun. that's true. Um, yeah. So I know that, you know, when I first heard about you, you've done some work with our team, um, you know, with some lending stuff and we've had a great relationship and Definitely. I originally thought you were just a lender. And then it just was recently, like we had more conversations and I found out you're, you're kind of into a lot of different things. So yes. um, I was like, Oh, he's, he's, he's ready to go. He's ready for projects. Um, stuff I wasn't <laughs> aware of. I thought you were just the money guy. So um, what kind of projects are you interested in? Because I've heard that you're, you're kind of, you're kind of into a lot of different stuff. Um, it's really, I, you strike me as the guy that's like, Hey, if it makes money, then it makes sense. Right. Yeah, no, I, I'd say that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much my, my approach. I can tell you that in my syndication stuff, so where I'm just a limited partner, it's almost like, you know, lending, but it's even more hands off than that is, is in self-storage is in multifamily, large multifamily, you know, hundreds of units uh, in a complex. And I'm in commercial space where Northrop Grunham or, you know, the U.S. military sort of affiliated people have tenants in there. So, you know, that's pretty much a guaranteed thing for the next 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I've got some that are, oh, it's like a warehouse, but it's being rented out. Each individual floor is being rented out to each individual cannabis operator, all legal stuff, all, all fully, you know, legit. But yeah. That's on Colorado. Something is in Texas, something in California, something in Indy. So I'm just, like you just said, as long as it is a safe, secure investment that is well vetted with an operator or uh, the the borrower is well vetted and, and the team makes sense and the deal makes sense and it's going to generate revenue, uh, I'm all for it. And now I'm looking to get into more multifamily where I'm the operator, where I'm the yeah. syndicator, and I can put together a deal for a hundred unit complex and get, I'm already doing so many talks and I'm already involved with so many people who have access to funds that are ready to deploy into private loans or deals that make sense. And so I just want to leverage that network that I've built over this past two years and, and be able to get a syndication of my own going. So that's, that's my primary focus now is to get that started. And uh, beyond that, I'm just did flips earlier this year. I've got a buy and hold and I'm just finishing up a project just, today I got my final walkthrough punch list of, all right, let's just, you know, get it on the market. So I'm, I'm looking at everything that makes sense. And I would rather much go back to doing more lending and syndications versus doing my own flips and own buy and holds. But, you know, there are certain needs like to qualify as a real estate professional status for yeah. the IRS tax standpoint, I had to have rentals. Yeah. So I was literally doing a flip when I discovered this need and I said, all right, well, it's no longer a flip. It is now being converted to a rental. And it makes perfect sense as a burr. Sure. I've got probably close to 40000 in equity in that deal uh, after I'm all in. So I said, all right, well, I'm going to burr it out of it and, and just keep it as a rental. Uh, and luckily enough, I got an excellent tenant um, government job for the last eight years, not going anywhere. So nice. I figured, all right, nice, stable tenant, get her in there and be done with it. So you know, it's just as the need arises, you shift, you change, you, uh, and you buy right. Everybody talks about, you know, you make money when you buy. Well, I bought it as a flip and it makes perfect sense, but even as a rental, it makes even more sense. Yeah. And, and, and no cash in the deal. Probably I'll probably get cash out of this deal and still cash flow. you know, a couple hundred bucks a month easily. So it just, th those are the kinds of deals you, you, you go for where it makes sense no matter what. Yeah. No, I love those, uh, like when we, when I see a property come across, it's a flip, but you know, it, it, the buyer ends up being someone who just wants to like use, like you said, use a burr or just do a short-term rental, but you find properties like that, that you can have multiple exit strategies. Um, it's, it's always the best man. So, Definitely. um, so it's, so with projects here in Indy, kind of what do you have going on right now? How many, do you have units here? Are you working on a couple of flips? Uh, let's just talk about the projects that you've got going on here, just in Indy. Um, and just hear more about that. Yeah. So in India, I've got one single family home. My first single family home as a rental. Never wanted those, but it just ended up working out that way. And 
I've got one duplex that I'm finishing up. Like I said, this week, it should be hundred percent ready to go. And it's already going to get started marketing uh, by the time this, this podcast comes out. And then beyond that, I don't have any other active holds in Indy, okay. but I would like to do flips. So I'm definitely looking out for flips and uh, the neighborhood, you know, you guys had a podcast just out a couple uh, very recently around neighborhoods for fix and flips and neighborhoods mm-hmm. for holes and neighborhoods for this. So, you know, I'm going to leverage that knowledge and then go after certain assets to get some flips going. But if I was to expand my rental portfolio again, it would be more towards the higher unit count, not the 5, 10, 20, but more 75, 100 unit count is my next approach. And I'm looking around Indiana, uh, all over Indiana to see if I okay. can find something that makes sense and maybe even outside of Indiana. But that's that's definitely the approach now. And, and all my loans are all over Indianapolis uh, from... Yeah, from twenty thousand dollar deals to two hundred fifteen thousand dollar deals, uh, it's all over the place. It's all over, yeah. yeah. So those one hundred plus transactions you, you said you've done um, are those majority here, I, like Indianapolis, just Midwest, or are those spread out? No, everywhere? that's that's pretty much all. Ninety nine percent of it is all Indianapolis, Circle okay. City, right there. Okay, awesome. Um, and I, I have to ask, out of 100, 100, prop, 100 transactions or 100 lending um, transactions, uh, are they all successful? Are there any, uh, any fallout or any, any, anything fishy going on with any of those? 0% default rate so far. Okay. That's pretty impressive. So uh, <laughs> I'm knocking on chairs, wood anywhere. That <laughs> yeah, I'm knocking for you. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's talk about that. Um, so how do you... When it comes to someone approaching you to, uh, you know, lend on their deal, um, how do you vet them? Like, what are some key things that you look for? And because um, 100 plus transactions, zero defaults. I mean, let's you got You're doing it right, man. So, um, like, what are those key factors that you're looking at for each deal? Trustworthiness, open, honest conversations, some background and history in doing the type of strategy that they want to deploy if they're a buy and hold and they're looking for bridge funding or if they're a flipper and they've done 50 deals or if they're a company an entity that's been around 10, 20, you know, 10 years plus, and they've been in the indie market forever. I mean, you guys are a great example of that. And, uh, you know, just, just having the ability to be able to validate what they're saying, to be able to vet, what they say is the truth. Like if they say, Oh, I've been around forever and I do all these deals. Well, where are the HUD statements to prove it? Can I go onto the Marion County website and check your, uh, you know, where you actually put the stamp and it gets recorded. Is there, is it, is it the truth? Can I find it? And is your entity on the statement of information on your entity documentation show the proof that you've been around forever and you've done deals. And when you tell me that you got the money, I want to see a bank, you know, statement or a live view that shows me, yep, you've got the money ready to go. And so it's just, it's being able to trust what they say. And after a couple of deals, I want to be able to get to the point where an email comes in and I should be able to say yes or no within 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And there are borrowers I have like that where I can get the email and within 20 minutes, I'll know whether it's a done deal or not. And luckily I've been able to fund within six hours, eight hours if needed. Yeah from from the email coming in to request like hey just breathe i had this other financing lined up or this deal just came up and i need the money tomorrow no problem money's wired today because i know i trust your deals i know i trust your analysis i trust the location go for it let's do this and so the documentation will just go to the title company and that's the one thing that i will always advocate for is relying on trained professionals in the industry so if you are leveraging a broker for their bro- you know broker pricing opinion make sure that broker has been around forever knows the market and knows the neighborhoods street by street that's mm-hmm. what indy is not yeah. neighborhood by neighborhood zip codes it's literally street by street, street. By street. And, yep. and and they should know it right if i say the address they're like oh yeah it's on the corner of that and that and oh the shooting happened here or there was a robbery over mm-hmm. there like i can these are actual live conversations i have with my broker while I'm telling him hey i've got a deal that shows up here Oh man, you know, I heard about the shooting that happened over there two days ago. Wow. Okay. I just gave you an address, not a street corner, not a zip code. Yeah. Just gave you an address and you know that within a quarter mile a shooting happened. All right. That's clearly somebody that's in the know. Yeah. Then, then if you've got a GC or a contractor or 
your handyman, something that you can rely on that worst case scenario, the property comes back to you, you can go in and get it fixed up and get it, uh, you know, sold or rented or whatever your, your exit strategy may be. That's an important piece to have. Title companies, they're, they're super important because your vested interest in the property is only as safe as what the title company is able to put on paperwork, get it stamped and get it recorded. Mm -hmm. So relying on them for your title insurance and your uh, property information and making sure there's no fines and all that stuff on it. So you get everything up front and that makes a huge difference in being safe and secure in your investment and knowing what it's going to be, uh, what it's going to be like and what your, what issues you may face later on down the road. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, kind of on this point of like vetting the people that you're going to do business with, mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of, you know, new investors out there that their main struggle is just finding the right people to go to. So if someone's approaching you that hasn't done a, their deal yet, let's say they just want to, they found their first flip that they want to do, because that's typically what people start out with mm -hmm. um, their first flip. Like what, what's your minimum um, that they have to have as far as, because I'm, I'm assuming you won't, for someone new, even if they're friends of your best friend. You might not fund everything for them. Maybe I'm wrong, but you typically, no, that's not what I hear. But um, like, no. what, what do you want from them to say, all right, like I'll, I'll help you out here, get this first deal. Um, then we'll kind of go from there. I have never funded a flip. End okay. of story. I, I've never paid for rehab costs. I have, okay. I only fund purchase price. And I've created this whole equation for myself where I can look at loan to value as is, loan to ARV, loan to purchase price, and you know, do some calculations around those three values and figure out what the loan amount is that I want to give someone. But it's always against purchase price. I've never funded rehabs. So if they've got skin in the game enough to be able to cover the rehabs, I'm more than happy to work with them. Okay. You know, I may ask them for who you're, who you're planning to use as GC, who you're planning to use as a project manager if you're out of state, property manager if you're going to hold it. You know, I, I want to know who their team is. Who else are they relying on besides me for money so that I can then rely on that, like I said, the trained professionals and their expertise in their specific niche. Yeah. So if they've got a team that is an expert in their niche and I know that team and I know those members, it's a lot easier to say, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll give this to you because you have other professionals that are going to manage my money. Basically, yeah. right? Like my investment is in good hands besides just you managing the rehab. So even if they go overboard on the rehab and the property sells for less than they expected, as long as my investment is secure, that's what's the most important thing. Of course, I want everyone to succeed, but it's never been the scenario where my borrowers have lost money on a deal, yet I've walked away scot-free. Okay. At least not that I've been told that. And uh, I, I like proactive approaches. If you're having a problem, if your rehab's not going well, you need an extension, reach out. I've extended loans for people all the time, you know, from the initial term. And it's always been favorable enough where it's been repeat customers. So it's, it's just being open, honest, having frank conversations, relying on your teams as best as you can and, and having a good strong team to begin with is what I look for. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, some really good advice because I know, um, I mean, I was in this situation like seven years ago. I, I wanted to start flipping a house. I immediately went to the people with money and if they would have been, if they would have been people like you, like, Hey, who's your team? Who's your agent? Who's your contractor? I would have said, I'm still figuring that out. It would have been a big red flag. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, so it's, yeah, it's kind of relatable to like what we do in the wholesaling business. It's like, Hey, before you start looking for properties, make sure you have cash buyers that can close. Yep. So before someone approaches you for a funding deal, let's make sure that you've got your, your other, the other people and your team in place, because that's going to exactly. be just as important to you as it is to them. So no, that's, that's awesome advice. Um, so I've, I've even told, uh, I've even told a lot of people that if you ever have a doubt in a deal you're about to do, there is no one better to tell you or yay or nay than a lender. I don't care if it's me. I don't care if it's a bank. I don't care if it's a credit union or a hard money lender or other private guys, funds, whatever. Anybody you go to who you ask for money from is going to vet the deal from the most numbers only perspective. They have no emotions in the deal. They don't really care if it's got the amazing architecture or if it's got a, you know, this beautiful hardwood or woodwork from the original Fountain Square, Irvington areas. Like the lender won't care. They care about what are you buying it for? What is the valuation going to be? What's your budget looking like? What's the spread in between? Is it going to be profitable for you and for them? 
and, and they'll give you the hard facts. They'll do their own research. They'll have their own ARVs. They'll have their own BPOs and CMAs and appraisals and whatever it takes, but they will give you cold hard facts that you may not be ready to accept. So you may be emotional and get into a deal and say, yep, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But then the lender is going to look at it from their point of view, from the investment security standpoint, yours and their own, because they want you to succeed. And we, you know, as a lender, I can tell you, I want my borrowers to succeed every single time. So they come back for more deals and they bring more deals and my money's at play and they're more successful and they keep doing better and better deals. So, you know, we all want everyone to succeed. It's just, you need to focus on getting the emotion out getting all the documentation ready, getting everything that you possibly can research wise up front and knowing if the deal is going to make sense. And then the lender is definitely going to be the last final, you know, check mark. Yep. If the lender approves it pretty much, and they're a good enough lender and smart enough and, and they've been in the industry and they've been in that specific, you know, area niche enough, well then they can easily tell you, yeah, it's going to make sense or not. Yeah, no, totally agree there. Um, so with your, your personal private lending that you do, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty normal that you, like you as a lender want to be in, always in first lien position. Um, is there, are there times where it makes sense to go in second lien position if someone's using you and someone else? So like you, we mentioned earlier, you can fund the, the purchase. Someone yep. else is going to fund the rehab. If it's, I mean, if, if you're one of those people, how do you make sense of going in second lien position? I will tell you that so far I've never done a second position lien and I don't particularly have any interest in being in that second position, but I would say that if someone's considering being in a second position lien, they've got to be even more astute about the numbers and t and be even more conservative about the ARVs and potential equity in the deal because that's all they have to fall back on. Yeah. They don't have that level of security as a first position lien where I don't care if the property goes to auction or goes wherever, either it gets foreclosed on and, and we take it back or it gets sold off in some way, shape or fashion and we get our money back, right? So that first position lien is a lot more secure than a second. Not to say that a second is not a good idea. I mean, there are so many people, uh, you know, I've heard so many podcast uh, interviewees talk about how they run funds for second position liens or they only do second position liens, that they're the most successful but there, I believe that there are more high risk, high return. Yeah. Because you can buy them if you're buying a note or a second position note and you know, non-performing second position. Heck, those are, you know, literally pennies on the dollar. You, you may yeah. buy it at five cents on the dollar, but, and then you can get it performing even halfway and now you're 50% returns easily, but now you're taking that risk that all your investments going to go away. So I think for second position liens, especially for rehabs and stuff, it's just, be conservative about the ARVs and, and be conservative about the, the rehab costs because you don't want to, want to just add the 5% padding. You may want to add 15% padding. And the, the, the newbie, the more newer the investor is that's borrowing it, the more padding you want to give them because they may yeah. not know what truly it costs to have mold remediation. They don't really don't know what it may cost to have all the plaster in the whole house removed, all new sheetrock, all new insulation, tape, mud, paint. They may not know what a brand new kitchen costs, but they're assuming it's 5,000, but in reality it may cost 15 for the neighborhood they're in, right? right. So it's just, you wanna be more, more conservative in that second position than you are in the first position where just the asset alone is securing your, your position. Okay, no, that's great advice there. Um, so how about, uh, uh, this might not apply directly to you, but let's say that there's like, there's some investors here in Indy that, um, you know, they can't find a deal right now, but they've got their own cash that is just mm -hmm. sitting there. Um, would you encourage them to say, Hey, like, why don't you start using that cash and start doing some private lending on your own just to, just to make it go to work somehow um, mm -hmm. and just make some money or, or uh, kind of how do, how do you feel about that? Yeah. So as I can tell you from personal experience, right, since May, the deal flow has been limited. Yep. And whether you're an investor, lender, whatever, and the, a lot of the money is dried up outside. So a lot of the hard money lenders or even private lenders that were out there that were doing deals very often have pulled back, have started being ultra conservative on their loan to values or loan to purchase price. And so I think, yes, it's definitely a great idea but you got to make sure that your due diligence is on point. You don't want to just 
open the floodgates and go onto Facebook groups and start posting, I got money to lend, bring me deals. Oh yeah. Your, your, your messages would fill up fast. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, your inbox is going to be full, but you're going to have to be diligent about who you give your money to. And, you know, that's, that's one service that I've been starting to look at providing is uh, if other people have money to invest and they want to put it in, uh, in safe, secure deals, and I may have better deal flow. I may have better qualified borrowers that I've done, you know, like I said, hundred plus transactions, it's not an easy thing to accomplish very quickly. And that's, and, and all successfully uh, exited. It, it speaks volumes to the level of people that bring the deals to me. So mm-hmm. if you want to invest and you want to put your money into deals, but you don't want to do the due diligence from scratch and learn the whole process end to end without any assistance. Well, then you find somebody who can help you yeah. and who's done enough of those deals. I don't care if it's me, if somebody else just, leverage somebody else's experience and time and their expertise and their templates and their legal team and their brokers and their GCs, whoever they, that, that team is critical. So if you've got your own and you want to rely on that and you've done enough deals where you feel like, dude, I can analyze deals, no problem. And you'll lend your money out. Great. I would say that's an amazing way to go. Definitely do it. But if you haven't done as many and you've got cash to deploy and you want to get the passive income, like you guys always talk about, you know, yeah, you should definitely lend out, but leverage somebody else's experience. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of leading into like my last question here is people who are wanting to get into this that aren't really familiar with the real estate world or the real estate investing side of things, but they've got the money out there. They're, they don't want to put it in the stock market. Um, you know, they're hearing about their buddy doing great. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they hear about their friends and or their uh, you know coworkers doing great investing in real estate. Um, so your advice really would be to maybe connect with someone like yourself or someone with the experience to kind of show them show them the ropes, um, get exactly. them get them the right deals, help them vet the right deals. Um, it's kind of yep. it's kind of the direction you would take. Yeah, definitely. I think if you can gain knowledge from somebody else's experience and know what the pitfalls are, what to look out for, where to do your research, where to do your due diligence, how do you run a background check? Should you run a background check? And how do you get, you know, how do you vet entities versus borrowers and what, what things to look out for in the note? Because every single thing is a document that is securing your investment. And if something is awry in the title of the comp- of the property, if there's something awry in the note itself and you missed writing one little statement, well, all of a sudden that layer of security is gone or that recourse is gone. And so, yeah, it's definitely key to leverage somebody else's experience and time that they've already invested in learning this process and getting good at it and have a track record to prove it. And then, you know, at least springboarding yourself off of, off of their experience and getting into it quicker and hopefully in a safer position than you would on your own. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, kind of wrapping up here. Um, I like to kind of end things on uh, as, asking this question, like what's, what's your favorite thing about Indianapolis? Uh, not, it doesn't have to be about, you know, real estate investing in particular, but I just like to hear what everyone's <laughs> answer is to this question. Like what's your favorite thing about Indianapolis, man? Man, I haven't been in India in over two years now. And I, I'm dying to come back. I had plans on going back out there now, but yeah, I would say the people are are way chill. It's not as crazy pace as the coasts are, and it's not as slow as Florida is, where I was for <laughs> like 15 years. And but it's it's got the right pace. I think the the people are, you know, they, they keep their heads down. People are working hard. People know what they're talking about, but they they're not high strung like the coasts are. And, and that's what I like is dealing with individuals who are open, honest, just, you know, do what they say they're going to do and are hardworking, dedicated people. And I see a lot more of that in Indy than I see in Tampa where it's all either partying or Miami where it's partying or it's West yeah. coast where it's just crazy, 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 you know, 20 yeah. hours a day and you get four hours of rest. So it's just, I like the, the balance between pace and the work getting done and the types of people and their mentality in, in Indy overall. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. All right, Jesper. Well, we're out of time here. Um, just real quick. Did, did you want to just drop anything? If anyone wants to find you on social media or do you have a website that people can go to kind of check you out a little yeah. bit more? Yeah. So thanks to Ernesto's uh, India, Indianapolis out of state investors group on Facebook. You can find me out there. Just my name, just read the I've got a company page, JGB com, And you can, you know, uh, check me out there and see what I've done and get in touch with me that way. There's a 
button to click and book some time with me to talk and that'd be the best way to approach me. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on. Uh, thanks for everyone listening out there and we will see you on the next episode. Take care. Later, bro. Thank you.